Welcome to the Master Passive Income Show. My name is Dustin Heiner, and I'm here to help you learn how to quit that J-O-B, that just overbroke job, by investing in real estate so you never, ever have to work a job again. Today, I'm super excited to bring on somebody who's going to help us to do a number of things inside of a real estate investing business so we can get to eventually buy and hold. It could be flipping, it could be buying and holding, it could be lots of other things, but what we do here is we invest in real estate, we want passive income, and we want to create generational wealth. I am super excited to have an awesome guest on, Justin Colby on the show. Justin, thanks so much for being here. What's up, Justin? What's happening? Appreciate you having me, dude. Yeah, this is great having you on. And as I was looking through the things that you have done and you're doing in your business, it's, it seems like this is something that a lot of people are really looking at, especially flipping, because you have a podcast called The Science of Flipping, which is super awesome. And I get a lot of students that say, hey, Dustin, should I flip homes to make money to buy long-term rental properties or buy and hold rental properties? Like, yeah, that's a great way to do it. You know, if you save your own money and put in your 401k, that's another way to get money. If you have private money, if you have hard money lenders, signature loans, like there's lots of ways to get money. But that, that, well, that we're, I'm jumping way ahead. So Justin, tell us about you and how you got started investing in real estate. Yeah, well, it came out of desperation. Uh, back in 06, 07, I lost my home to foreclosure as so many millions of people. I was a statistic, if you will. Um, and it got really bad to the point where I was sleeping on a couch. Uh, a, the repo man took my car. Uh, I had to walk away from $40,000 of credit card debt. And that is all because I did really well going into that time. And then obviously it was young, mismanaged money, had no real skill set. Uh, and so I wasn't able to sustain that level of income when the real estate market crashed. So I didn't want to be a realtor anymore. I was a realtor then I knew I wanted to be in real estate. And so, uh, you know, again, this is way before any of the shows the flip this house and flip that. And, you know, all that, that didn't exist. Um, what we have, these podcasts didn't exist. So I just had to figure it out on my own. Um, and so I started cold calling realtors way back in the day. Um, ironically now, one of my favorite softwares in my own company and something I teach all my students to use is Privy, which gives you, they have access to like 80 something direct feeds to MLS. Uh, so it's kind of weirdly all come full circle after 15 years. So I've been in the game for 15 years. Obviously I'm in a much better position financially now than when I started. Uh, and that's the goal for all of you listening to this, right? Is to change your financial direction, right? Both with, you know, income and wealth building. Right. And so that's why you're here. That's why you're listening to it. And I would tell you, you know, 15 years in the game, 2,200 deals done um, actively, literally Dustin, I had to put Dustin on hold for a second. I had to answer a call with my contractor. I'm buying another rental in Oklahoma city, uh, hopefully. And um, so, yeah, I'm actively in the game. I'm wholesaling 10 to 20 deals a month. I'm actively burring for those that don't know what that is buy, remodel rent and refinance. Uh, so yeah, it's a fun game. It can make you a ton of active income. And from there you can build your wealth through real estate. So did you get started with flipping first or was it buy and hold first? Or how did that come about that first deal? Flipping first, not even wholesaling. I mean like flipping, right? And people are like, well, yeah, but you were broke. How do you have money? Well, back then transactional funding was a very big thing. And so I was able to uh, use these lenders who would literally lend me money 24, 48 hours. And essentially I had to go hustle and find the buyer. Right. Um, again, there's none of this software that we all have access to today. So I'd get it under contract and then I'd have to hustle to find the buyer who could close in essentially 48 hours, right. After closing. So, uh, it was a grind. I didn't know what I was doing. I know systems, but I was flipping them quick flipping. Right. So I'd actually take title. My entity would take title. And then again, 24, 48 hours, there'd be a second escrow called double closing uh, right afterwards. But we'd actually fund. It wasn't the definition of double closing now where you're kind of using the end buyer's money to fund your transaction and then simultaneously fund the second transaction. We would actually fund using a loan, then resell it. So that's how I broke into space. We weren't remodeling, but we were flipping. So the, the flipping would lead into having more cash. But like you said, it's active income. You got to keep flipping that next property in order to make more money. Like once you sell it, you're done. Like you don't have that property anymore. That's it. So from there, when did you transition or transition or start getting into, hey, this could actually make me money every single month in passive income? Long time. Biggest mistake I made. I've done this business 15 years. The biggest mistake I made is the first 13 years not buying rentals. 
um, if I can get anyone to listen to this one point, I've made tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. I have lost millions. So you always want to make more and you lose. But the biggest mistake is not getting into the rental game. Even if I bought one rental property a year from the first year, let's even just call it the second year just to get some money under my belt. One rental property a year. By now, I would literally have at least one home fully paid off free and clear, likely on the verge of a second and third, right? Because I would likely have gotten 15-year mortgages. I would have one already paid off. Now, the key to that, why I'm so such a, a fervent advocate of building wealth, buying rentals, isn't for the income. It is not. There's a much bigger and smarter play here. And my angle is being bankable. If you really want to create wealth, you are going to borrow money. Maybe you do a syndication, you raise a fund, I have a fund. Um, but the reality is if you have assets, again, if I just use the 15 years I've been in the business and I had one asset paid off free and clear, second one essentially is right there. Third one is right there. Then you know the fourth and fifth probably has a decent balance and et cetera. The banks are going to come and look at this equity and say, I'm going to give you a million dollars against all 15 homes. And you can do a couple of things with that. You can go buy another 15 homes with a million dollars. Or essentially, you could put it in your pocket tax-free. Who could use an extra million dollars tax-free? And by the way, a million dollars tax-free is essentially like making closer to $2 million, right? Because after taxes, et cetera. So for me, the wealth creation is more important for the bankability than it is for any income. Quite frankly, all my rentals I have now, and I'm on trajectory of closing one to two a month I'm buying. And I want that to increase, by the way. I'm nowhere near where I want to be. Um, so I'm buying one to two a month or so. Um, I would tell you, all the money that stays in in those deals to buy more, I do not want to take a dollar out of it. Um, and I love the depreciation. Right. So I have a very big tax bill each and every year. So my accountant loves over the last couple of years that I've been buying rentals because even if you don't have a big income, you still want write offs. You don't necessarily want to be paying the bank. So I'll tell you, there's a, again, I look at it in a different way. I don't do it for the income per se. Now, when I have the 2000 doors that it might is my goal, I want 2000 doors. Um, yeah. I'll probably be taking some income from that, right? And I'll probably be doing it well before the 2000 doors. But until I get to a place of there's a lot of money rolling in, I'll create income, whether it's, well, for me, it's the active investing. But for many of you listening, whether you have a job, whether you're flipping yourself, whether whatever the case is, create the active income so you can build the wealth out, create bankability. And I'm telling you, your life will, your, your kid's life will change. And you're right. Being bankable, basically banks being able or willing to lend you money, that's huge. And same thing with having access to capital. Same, same, basically same exact terminology in a sense where you have the ability to get money and access to capital, being bankable, because it it's going to be hard for somebody to save up, let's say $300,000 on their own. It's going to take a long time. But if you can get a down payment, if you could flip a house and get money for a down payment or whatever, but you're also utilizing other people's money, like the bank's money, or if you have a home, you could even get a home equity line of credit on your rental properties. I, I literally just called the Bank of America and said, hey, I have a rental property. It's an investment property. It's an LLC. Would you guys put into a uh, home equity line of credit? They said, yeah, absolutely. We could do that. And obviously, there's a little nuances of what they would do. But you're getting access to capital. That's in order to buy the next property and continually grow. I love that ability. Now, talk to me about how you would, let's say somebody doesn't have much money and they thought they have an idea, like I either want to wholesale properties or I want to flip a property so I can have more money to then use that for a down payment. Like I need to start somewhere to get more money. Then I can hopefully yep. buy and hold long-term properties. How would somebody like, is that something that is a good idea? Is that a bad idea? How would we get started in doing that? So I think it's all a matter of marketing. I don't think it's one or the other. It's an and. Meaning if you are going to get into real estate, give all, all the chances you can get to diversify what you can do with that asset, right? And so that is more of a marketing focus. 
Because the more opportunity, I call it an opportunity business. And I know in some circles, that's a negative word, right? That's a negative phrase. But the reality is the more opportunities you have, the more you can wholesale, flip and buy and hold, right? Those are your strategies. And sometimes it's going to be a better fit to flip it. Sometimes it's going to be a better fit to hold it because of the price point. And if you're in, if you're good, or if you have a good coach, at least teaching you creative financing deals, now you have, so I just bought a duplex in Cleveland, Ohio with $0. It's a hundred percent financed, hundred percent finance, but I know how to structure that and negotiate that and, and, you know, can get that deal. Um, I would tell anyone, you just need to be talking to more sellers you need to be making more offers. Um, and then layer on some more advanced techniques about sub two wraps, seller financing, things of that nature, which you should all be investing in a coach one way or another, all of you, um, because you need to be able to know those things because the competition you feel like you have is me, is Dustin, is people that have been doing this for quite some time, right? So you want to do your best to be able to learn some of those tactics soon, right? Because it's only going to give you more opportunity to build wealth. Uh, I just bought one in Dayton, Ohio, subject to, I had to bring the loan current. So I had to come to the table with 20,000 and some change. Um, so it brought the loan back to current. Um, and I have a great 3.75% interest rate on the loan. It's phenomenal. And essentially like I didn't have to do anything. Right. So the more you can understand that, the faster you can start to build your rental portfolio. It, I totally agree. And I personally invest in Ohio as well. Ohio is a great market, especially for cash flow. So two parts to the creating generational wealth, but also wealth for you right itself right now. We need passive income. So two parts of the question. Number one, how much money would you suggest or do you try to make in passive income every single month from each property that you buy, duplex, single family home, whatever it might be. But then at the same time, how do you make sure that it's managed? Do you manage these properties yourself? Do you hire other people? How do you take care of both the passive income and the management? Great question. So uh, interestingly enough, so I have a group of homes in Birmingham, Alabama I have bought. They have a property management company that we work with. I have a group of homes in Oklahoma City. They do not. My partner, who I went in on these rentals with, actually does all the management himself. I think he probably should get out of that role and we should just bring in a property manager but um, in terms of like Ohio, some of these deals that I've just recently bought, I'm going to bring in um, one of my partner's kids. I'm going to be kind of coaching him, if you will. So he's going to be doing all of the dirty work, right? And, you know, to kind of elevate him potentially into the company as we continue to grow. So um, kind of all over the board there, you know, my, my, Fat my druthers, everything has a property management group. Now people are all oh, 10% and blah, blah, blah. And that's your profit margin. Again, you got to remember for me, I'm not doing it for the income. I'm doing it for the wealth creation. I will do something else such as wholesale and flip for the income. Um, so you got to understand why you're doing it. I think one of the biggest mis misleading points of all this whole thing is people don't even understand the decision they're making to do this business. Why are you doing it? Don't tell me, you want to build wealth for generational wealth. Like, stop. If if that's your reason, you're going to buy one home every couple of years, maybe sort of. You're going to be a landlord that has five homes in 10 years. And you're going to be like, oh, there's too much headache to this. I'm just selling these. Make a decision of why you want it, right? And then you're going to be able to run a lot faster. And so uh, for that, I would say property management is the only way, right? Um I don't want to self, I don't have time to self-manage any of it, right? So that's why I'm telling you, my partner does some, and then we're bringing in uh, his son to do the, do the others. Um, but yeah, in terms of buying and then, you know, how much per door do I want to be making? You know, I'm buying lower price properties. Like for example, this home that you, you heard me talking to my contractor, the buy price is $25,000. I know it sounds crazy. It's $25,000 in Oklahoma City. And we're going to probably have to put in, and you heard this too, I want to be somewhere around seventy five dollars to $80,000 and it'll be worth one hundred and thirty. dollars um, It'll rent for anywhere from $1,100 to $1,300 if I do Section 8, which is what I want to do. Um, I might be able to get up to like $1,500 a month in rent. So really is a good, uh, great little safe rental. It's never going to become you know a million dollar property. I'm not going to gain all this equity in it but it's a great place to put my money. It's a great place to build equity. And again, if you have 200 doors like that, 
bank say, man, you are here's here's five million dollars. Go do it again. Right. So, yeah, it does. And with banks being having a good track record with the bank is just like being bankable. They, they come back. You come back to them. Hopefully, if you're smart enough, you're either having local banks, but you're just creating a relationship. And I believe that real estate's not about a property. It's about people. Business is not about a product. It's about people. The more people that you can work with, more people you can help out, the more people that you can either help out of a property because they're selling or they want, they need to sell, they need to get out or a tenant in a place or this banker needs to get a loan. And then you can uh, provide them as you, hey, I'm the lender or sorry, the borrower. I would love to borrow the money from, from them. And so if you create relationships all around you, it's just going to make your life so much better. I know when I first got started, I was right around the same time as you. I started investing in 2006. There were these podcasts or YouTube channels. There wasn't anything other than those quote unquote gurus that would like fly into your town and do a two hour seminar. It's all sales pitch for more and more things. That was all there was back when I got started. And so it was sure. so lonely and I had just had to push through it. And with that, now it's so great when, like you said, having other people around you that you can, like, let's say you get a coach or get a mentor or even just get in a community, like a Facebook community where of other people that are doing it, it just makes it so much easier. So talk to me about partnering because you, you said you have uh, at least one partner, but talk to me about partnering. I'm personally, I, I've had partners in the past and it does seem like I do 100% of the work and still get 100% of liability, but 50% of the profits. Talk to me how this, how we can make a pro, uh, a partnership work with real estate investing. Well, for me, it's more about finances, right? Like I can go further faster with capital partners. Um, there's always debt. Like if there's something where I can do debt, like quick flips, I, I don't need a partner. Just debt. Give me a hard money loan. It's not a partnership. It's just debt. I get 100% of everything. But if I want to really run fast and buy as many rentals as I possibly can, I do very well. But at some point, my money's limited, right? Um, and then also, everyone has always been taught other people's money, right? OPM. So I firmly believe that. Now, a lot of people have a lot of money right now, right? And it's just sitting there. So one of my partners literally came to me. The reason why he became a partner is he was like, dude, I have so much money in my um, retirement account, like seven multiple seven figures. Can I lend you money or something? And so I was like, well, I don't really need debt, right? Like I don't need debt money. But if you want to buy rentals with me, let's roll, right? So that's how that came up. Now, he does nothing for the real estate side. But he gives me access to a lot of freaking money that I can just, as long as the numbers work out, I can move a lot faster, right? So Would that be a loan or does he have he also equity doesn't, in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'll get 50% of the deal. I get 50% of the deal. Now, it doesn't it. always have to be 50-50. But the reality is part of the reason why I gave him 50-50 is because there's nothing, there's no loans recorded. It's all cash. There's no, it's a very easy scenario, right? So I don't have to pay him monthly. There's nothing like that. So, and he he believes the same way I believe in the sense of if we make a dollar, we don't take the dollar. The dollar stays in the entity and let's go do it again, right? And so he doesn't need the income. I never want to partner with someone that needs the income. Um, So I, I, for me, capital partners is what I'm talking about. I've also gone down the path of partnerships. While they do serve at their place from time to time, I don't believe in a partnership just because you're not good at operations and you're good at sales, but you need the operations, you can hire that person, right? So um, they're a hireable person, not a partner person where you're giving away 50%. If you're good at sales and you're driving all the revenue, it doesn't make sense to give away 50%. You're the money maker, right? You can hire someone who could spreadsheet and run analytics and all this other stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, it, but strategic partnerships are very important. Capital partnerships are very important, right? I have a, a fund. Uh, it is a fund for real estate investors. We want to partner with people because we will bring all the money and we will partner on a deal that that person may not be able to get done. I'm not talking about partner on like a little $200,000 flip. I'm talking about one of the first projects we uh, are partnering with is with the Four Seasons Hotel. In Vegas, we're funding a development for them to do residences in Las Vegas. And it is a partnership, right? And so uh, I say that to say there's there's a lot of value in partner, especially if it's about money, right? Not if it's just like, I don't really like cold calling, so I'm going to get a partner and he's going to cold call. That's 
that you could definitely you hire, hire somebody people. to do all that sort of stuff, but especially like you said, operations, like operations, like I don't want to manage any of my properties. I don't want to talk to my tenants at all. I would much rather right. have and pay for a property manager. But here's, you know, this, Justin, I don't pay for the property manager. Like I don't have to get a job to pay for my property manager. I make sure that expense is accounted for before I even buy the property so that I buy the property, right. the property manager is already in there. I don't have to think about it because it's already paid for. Now with that, how do we then scalar business? You, you touched on it a couple of times where you don't take that money out, like up, you create money in the business, you make it, and then you leave it in the business to do it again, to buy the next property and buy the next property. Sure. Is that the best way to scale? Or what are your thoughts about scaling the business to where we have multiple properties, 10, 20, 30 plus properties? Why don't you just go get more capital partners? I just talked about it, right? So it's not just about saving the money in the account and then go buy another. Go literally put this, I literally have helped my students make millions and millions and millions of dollars with this one thing. And I'm gonna give it to you free. You guys ready for it? Go to your Facebook account and write this one thing. You guys can thank me later. You will make millions and millions and millions of dollars of wealth building if you do this one thing. Hey, I'm looking for a capital partner to help with all the real estate investment opportunities I've been given recently. If you're interested in talking, send me a DM. That's it. You effectively now, if you do this right, all you have to do is post that. You effectively will have two to 10 people reach out to you. And they'll likely be people you never really thought about, right? They'll be the person you might work with, work next to. They might be your friend's mom, grandmother, or parent. And you're like, wow. I didn't even think they had money. And they have like a quarter million dollars sitting in their IRA doing nothing, losing money. And those, that one post, I promise you now, you guys all have everything you need to go buy your first all the way probably up to your 10th rental by that one post. I love it. That's it, what it, what you're doing effectively is letting everybody know that you're a real estate investor and that you have opportunities that they, if they want to take part in them or even just look at, that they could talk to you about it. And I remember when I, I lost my job and I was laid off. I was literally laid off when the recession hit. And I then realized nobody knew that I was trying to invest in real estate. So I started telling everybody as many people as I could that I was a real estate investor. And with that, I got so many people saying, oh, you do? Well, tell me about it. And either they'll tell me about it and they'll turn away and say, oh, that's not for me. And they'll walk away. Or they might say, hey, well, when you have something, you know, keep my name. I'd love to talk to you more about it, which is great because when you are utilizing other people's money, I love the, the term OPM or other people's money. It's because we're providing opportunities for other people as well as providing it for ourselves. Like if we're bringing the deal, they could bring the money. They could definitely take part inside of that equity and the, the whole property as a business that we're creating. So talk to me about how we are going to like, do we exit these properties? Do, is that your plan is to eventually exit the properties? Or are you going to hold on to them long term and give them to your kids? What are your thoughts about that? Mm. I think some properties will go longer term, but I think most will have like five year run rates every five years. And again, because the only people that give a damn about a property management group taking 10% are people who want to live off the income. I don't. So I don't care about that. So for me, it's all about a 1031 exchange. I sell however many $5 million worth of properties. I take it, I buy $10 million worth of properties, right? So do that every five years, get to a place where, you know, listen, I, it's aggressive. I want to hit that big B, that billionaire status. And that's just going to take time, work, energy, effort, and focus. I'm going to get it there. It's real estate. Yeah. So, so what happens... Um, so if, if you don't go for cash flow, or you obviously get some cash flow, but if you don't go for cash flow and you're looking to exit every five years, um, what happens when there is like last at least 13 years, it's just been an up cycle, up market and up, 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 up. In fact, I know of lots of people, they say, oh man, I, st I bought two Airbnbs and I'm making you know $10,000 a month from these two Airbnbs. I'm like, yeah, there's a reason why is because it's been an up market. People have so much money, like you said earlier, Justin. But I remember in 2010, hotels were about going bankrupt because people were not traveling. Nobody had money. So in an up market, everything's great. But in the down market, we also got to make money too. So another thing, like with syndications, we're buying multifamily. Being a syndicator, everybody wants to exit in three to five years. Now, the downside is that is 
you have to have another syndicator come on top of what you bought it for and hopefully cash out even more money so you can pay off yours. Then they're hoping and somebody else comes on top. You're doing it over and over and over again. But that's until the economy crashes or interest rates go up, which means they can't pay nearly as much. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you're going for appreciation. You're going, you're hoping to be able to sell it for more. Talk to me about how do you mitigate this problem? Like it does seem that 2023 is going to have a lot of turmoil, probably 24 and 25. There's going to be some issues in the economy. Talk to me about how do we protect ourselves? Yeah, I think timing does play into some of this stuff. But if we really think about it, there's still a national shortage of housing, right? So make sure your asset is something that is sought after, right? So if you have something everyone can get at all times, you're not going to have a high value for it, right? So that is something you got to account for. The reality is, you know, if I have to hold on for year number six, okay, I'll hold on for year number six. I mean, the worst we have ever seen was in 2008. Well, I don't want to say ever, but in my lifetime, that was the worst we saw financially for me. In the 80s, I was alive. Yes, interest rates were crazy. But here's the thing. People were still buying homes, right? Every We have an asset that everyone needs, doesn't even want. They need it. So you play around. Do I maybe sell on every four years? Maybe the market hits a point in four years. I'm like, it's actually a better time to sell now. Let's, let's not hold on for this five. There's no hard line in the sand for me, right? But the another key to this, Build a business that's around marketing because I'm an expert marketer. I will always find another deal. Even in a down market, I will find another deal and it will be a better deal in the down market, right? And then I'll be able to ride it back up. So even if I sell in a down market, I'm direct to the owner who's likely needing to sell because I'm a marketer. I'm direct to them. I'm going to get an even better deal with maybe more appreciation opportunity and I'll ride that for five years. So it's really about finding more opportunities after or when you're ready to sell than anything else. I don't care the market. There's always a great market because I'm going to be talking to someone who most likely is going to have a high motivation. And, and when not, I find that person, that's too. when I... Yeah, like every so, yeah. deal, like there's always going to be a deal at any high market, always. low market, every single market, there's always going to be a deal. And we just got to be wise investors in order to find and take down those great deals. Like you said, I loved how you said it because I tell this to my students all the time. They always ask me, should I do this or this or this? Should I save my money for a down payment or use it for this or use? I'm like, why would you use these ors? Like whatever deal comes your way, we figure out creative financing. We figure out how to take it down. We figure it out at the time. It's per deal. So I love how you had the perspective. Now, just there's so much more to cover, but we definitely ran out of time. I want everybody to know, how can they reach out to you? How can they find you even talk, talk to you more about this? I mean, getting into this investing right now and being able to capitalize on it is going to be so terrific. How can they find you? How can they reach out, reach out to you online? Yeah, I'd say go over to justincolby.tv, justincolby.tv. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, I give away a ton of free content. Uh, as you mentioned, I have my podcast. So if you're already listening to this on a podcast, go to the science of flipping, the science of flipping. And lastly, if you actually want to talk directly to me, cause I still actually engage, uh, is my Instagram, the Justin Colby. Uh, I'll actually be the person replying to you. So, uh, again, Justin Colby TV, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Instagram, the Justin Colby, and then I have a podcast, the science of flipping. Awesome. Hey, Justin, you gave us lots of great advice. Hopefully people will definitely check you out, but I really appreciate you coming on, giving us such great insights. So yes. hopefully people will take advantage of this as well. So I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, bro. Thanks for having me.